Hi there, I'm Jason Kupfler, and I'm the Sales and Marketing Officer for Vancouver Island Regional Library. And today I'm interviewing author Michael Christie about his book Greenwood in advance of his author reading here at the Vancouver Island Regional Library, the Harborfront branch, on January 25th. Hi, Mike. Hi, Jason. Did I get the date right on your event? It's the 25th, correct? I believe so. Yeah, it's on my <laughs> digital calendar. Don't trust my memory, but I think that's right. It's next Saturday. It's, it's whatever the Saturday is near the end of the month here. You're correct. Great. So how are you doing? I'm doing very well. Yeah. Good. How about yourself? Yeah, not too bad. Mm. And uh, end of a kind of a different, different kind of a week. So yeah. It has been. It's been with all the snow and the school closures. It's been a good day for re a good week for readers. I think everyone's yeah. been huddling absolutely. And books. So that's, I've enjoyed that. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, I have some questions that uh, my colleague and librarian uh, Casey prepared for us. So I'm going to start and uh, and start reading through those. And then I have some of my own questions, um, my reaction to reading Greenwood over the uh, the holidays. And uh, if there's anything else you want to add, um, we'll just go from there. All right. Sounds You're great. Have another sip of coffee. It's a tea, actually. I can't oh, drink coffee okay. this late in the day. It'll destroy my it. sleep. Yeah. I need to keep going. <laughs> All right. Mike, the book is at once historical fiction set at multiple periods in the past and science fiction set in the future. How did you negotiate writing in those genres at once? It's a good question and there's a big debate around the idea of dystopian fiction and there's been some debate around whether this book that I've written is a work of dystopian fiction and I had thought of it differently I thought of it more as I mean I'm only jumping about 15 years into the future um, and uh, the world that I write about in the future is 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 different than the world we're experiencing now but it's also didn't require a huge amount of imagination sadly to to go there right. for me so um, I spent a lot of my time on Galliano Island, uh, off just off the coast of Vancouver, and um, unfortunately, there the uh, western red cedars are browning and dying currently due to repeated drought stress, climate change induced right. drought stress. And so, my idea in the book, I write about the Great Withering, which is a, sort of a phenomenon that that l destroys most of the world's trees. That idea didn't feel so science fiction to me, uh, unfortunately. So, I mean, I like to write in between genres. I like to write in between classifications. And I think that this, it, with this book, I really tried to, uh, to do that. Yeah, and I, I personally think it works. That works really well. When I first started reading it, like the first 10 pages, and I saw it, you know, 2035 written on the page, and, and really, Someone said to me right around New Year's uh, that 1990 is as far away as 2050 is. And, and you stop and you think, that's crazy. But really, 2035 is, is a short 15 years away. Um, so when I first started reading it, I'm like, oh, no, this is, this is dystopian fiction. And, and yeah. I don't know if I'm in the mood for that right now. Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, like, like you said, it's, it's a very possible future. And... Uh, um, and, and it turns out that that's, you know, set in 2035 isn't, isn't the only thing that the book is about. Um, so it, for me, it was funny because near, near the end of the book, I was wanting more of 2035 than, than what you wrote in the end. So, yeah. um, so it, it's funny because I started out thinking, oh no, you know, it's dystopia and I don't yeah. want to be this far in the future. And then you take us, you know, you take the reader back, uh, you know, almost a century, actually more than a century. And then you find yourself wanting more of this, you know, to find out what happens, which, uh, and I should have said earlier, uh, spoiler alert um, for anyone that hasn't uh, read or finished the book, um, but it's, it's something that, that you don't give us uh, very much of in the end. Um, all right, so next question. Although the book takes the form of a multi-generational family saga, many of the family ties are in fact found family. Harris and Everett are brothers by virtue of them being the survivors of the train wreck, and Everett becomes Willow's father by finding her and taking care of her as his own infant. Can you speak about the theme of found family? Yeah, it's a, it's something that 
it's it's a notion that is very close to me personally for one um and and another it's I've always loved these kind of grand epic novels that have a family tree in the beginning and sort of really uh, span across time and, and, you know, demonstrate, you know, how one family has negotiated, you know, entire eras of history. Um, but I've always found them sort of fundamentally flawed in the sense that even just a simple family tree is an incredible deception because it leaves out uh, all the people on the edges, all the wives' families often are left out. It's a very patriarchal kind of structure. Right. Um, so I wanted to kind of both do that, write a family epic, but also question and interrogate um, what it, what a family really means. Because I often I think, you know, we have a sort of simplified version of what constitutes a family, how a family is made. And it's very much of a bloodline kind of view. But I think in the families of my friends and my own family, you see something much more complex and I would argue more beautiful mm -hmm. that were. Right. Yeah. All right. Um, so her next question is, Greenwood is part of a growing body of the genre climate fiction or cli-fi fiction that deals with climate change and global warming. I wasn't actually aware that there was such a, a genre right now. Um, are you a reader as well as a writer in this genre? Do you have any other uh, cli-fi books you would recommend? I'm currently writing a list of my 10 favorite uh, cli-fi novels for The Guardian uh, newspaper. Oh, great. Um, and so yes, this is in <laughs> the top of my mind right now. I mean, it's funny because I, you know, I, People have called my book science fiction, but it's it's almost it, it's inter interesting the fact that fiction has not really been engaging with climate change, and particularly right. looking at Australia right now, looking at you know all the stuff that you know is is cropping up all over the world. That's you know islands disappearing, sea level mm -hmm. change, species extinction how come everyone isn't writing about this right yeah. now? This is as real as it gets, but yet yeah. it's still viewed as science fiction when we talk about this stuff. And I think that's a big uh, problem that we have. So my number one book of work of Cli-Fi is actually um, The Grapes of Wrath, which uh, is a book that's extremely important to me. John Steinbeck mm -hmm. didn't know he was writing climate fiction at the time and didn't have a word for it. But when you think about that book, you know, there's a massive human-caused uh, climate disaster in the Dust Bowl brought right. about by greed and dumb farming practices. And people are fleeing it uh, to the coast uh, in a search of a better life. And I, if that isn't a climate change story, I, I'm not sure, in a microcosm, right. I'm not sure what, what else is. So that, um, The Overstory is a book that's really quite important to me. Uh, the Word for World is a Forest by Ursula, Ursula K. Le Guin is a fantastic early work of cli-fi. Those are just a few. Yeah. When is that going to be published in The Guardian? I, I, it's probably going to come around, out around the time that uh, my book comes out in the, or Greenwood comes out in the UK, which is February 24th. Oh, okay. So do we have to wait for that list before then, or is that something you could email us and we could put on our Facebook, like, like I could, yeah, I could email you the yeah. list without the sort of right. write up for each thing. Yeah. But yeah, just a bare yeah. list. I could just do that. the list. Yeah, that'd be for great. Sure. And then we'll yeah. we'll look for your write up uh, in a month's time. Yeah, right, great. Um, how do you see Greenwood in conversation with the classic Canadian literature theme of man versus nature? It's a very good question, and it's you know so much in Canada has been written about man versus nature and this struggle and the Margaret Atwood's survival obviously has been a huge, hugely influential book in relation to the Canadian identity and our place within the sort of the violence of nature and the dangerousness of nature and us just being surviving in it. Uh, but I think Greenwood has a different um, view on nature. It's, 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 at one time, it's not an argument that 
we humans are just awful despoilers and nature is this hapless victim that we all ought to pity, I think, which a lot of environmental type writing can take on that, um, right. take on that, that tone. I think it's more complicated than that. And I think that we need to really rethink our relationship with nature in general and, 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 and really look at it as a kind of interdependence. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you look at how this book is structured, it's like every character is dependent on another character. And it's almost like a web of interdependence throughout mm -hmm. the novel. And, and, I, and, and as well with, with nature and, and, the, and the natural world being, you know, sustaining us, killing us, um, supporting us, or eyeing us with its beauty, it's, it's, all, it's all part of the same thing. Yeah, and even in, you know, there's there's one quote, I think it's near the end of the book, or, or it might be three quarters of the way through, but just how, um, you know, if you look at a, a family or even in the forest, it's it's about the forest, not not the trees, right? And I think um, in the book, too, it's really interesting how there's really no black and white. I mean, you've got the industrial industrialists, but you also have the activists. But even they, they shift a little bit. Even Willow, the, you know, when the main character is, uh, you know, environmental activist, there's, you know, there's some shifting that you wouldn't expect with her and, and also her, her father, uh, you know, the industrialist. Um, so yeah, it's fascinating that it's not, it's not black and white. There's a lot of shades of gray in Greenwood. Absolutely, yeah. And that's, I mean, all the books that I love don't have good guys and bad guys, you know, and right. someone asked me why once and I remember just thinking, because, you know, I'm an adult and yeah. that's right. like, that life isn't like that. Life is yeah. like that. You know, you grow up and you realize that, wow, the CEO of a major oil corporation is not a mustache twisting villain who's right. thinking that he's going to destroy the world. Right. It's yeah. much more complicated than that. And, uh, and fiction at its best, I think, can get at that com complexity. Right. They can portray us as just human, you know, mm -hmm. and doing the best with what we have. And, uh, you know, every, you could say that about every character in this book. They're doing their best with, with what they've got. And that's my, yeah. that's my experience with people. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. All right. What does Greenwood have in common with your two previous works of fiction, the novel If I Fall, If I Die, and the interlinked short stories collection The Beggar's Garden? In what ways is Greenwood different? And I guess in what ways is it the same? Such a good question. I feel like I'm not even close to any kind of understanding with respect to like what I've been doing so far. I mean, I've been writing for a while now, but the the clarity as to like my global uh, or my larger purpose is not quite there for me yet, but I, if it ever, you're was. too close to it. That's right. Uh, but I, I do see themes recur. I see um, family dysfunction clearly, or, you know, family uh, bonds being tested. I see marginal people. I, I tend to write about people who are um, outsiders to some degree. There's a, you know, a, a woman who can't, who doesn't leave her house for 20 years. There are drug users, there are mentally ill, there are, you know, people struggling with grief, depression, all these sort of, uh, you know, all these, all, all of these themes are recurring in my work. Uh, and also like intergenerational misunderstanding, I, I find I write a lot about in this, in Greenwood in particular, there's this real, you know, one generation, as you mentioned, is a timber tycoon. His daughter is a right. uh, an environmentalist, and her son is a carpenter. And so there's right. this kind of push and pull that goes on uh, between the generations um, that I've really noticed in my experience of the world, and it's really something I like to get at with my my fiction. Yeah. All right. Um, Greenwood is set to be published in the U.S. in February. Mm -hmm. I think the novel and its themes will translate to an American audience. Well, it's uh, so far so good. I mean, it's a major publisher in the U.S. We've got a bunch of really good feedback. Uh, it's getting a review in the New York Times. It's uh, oh great. Yeah, there's been a lot of excitement. I think they're particularly around. Um, 
trees uh, and climate change and carbon and, you know, our role in nature 